Okay, well, last time we finished chapter one, or just about, so I think we will go on to chapter two now. Let you read uh, that material. Now, uh, the homework for Thursday, there's a couple of problems in chapter uh, two. Actually, I should explain about this. The difference between an exercise and a problem in the book, exercises are handwritten, problems are computer programming problems. Wait, did I say that right? Exercises are handwritten, problems are computer programs. Okay, so we have a set of exercises which you'll do on paper, but then there is also one program. That's a problem, that's in the problem section. And the program, like we mentioned last time, is to um, do the Towers of Hanoi. Command line version C++. To Zoom time. Okay, so today we're going to review C++. Now, we, everybody knows C++ now, so yep. we'll go pretty fast. Except that one thing that, that I want to emphasize here that we're going to, that's going to be very important whenever we go down to the lower levels of abstraction is the memory model. So we may not, you may not have heard this emphasis before. Okay, so here we go, C++. Um, have you memorized this figure yet? Absolutely. <laughs> oh. Okay, so seven applications, six higher language, five assembly, four operating system, five instruction set architecture level. And the main thing that we um, want to show here is that when you write a program in C++, you are writing a program at level HOL6, higher language 6. Then when you, before you can run the program, you have to compile it. So when you compile it, the compiler takes that program written in C++ at level 6 and translates it to level 3, machine language at level 3. Then that is the program that executes. Your application executes at level 3. Okay? So level 3 is called machine language because it's the language that the machine understands directly. And when you're like in a Unix environment or a Linux environment and you, and you do GCC or G++ and you, you compile a program, what is the name of that file, the default name of the file, which is the machine language program version of your C++ source code? Nobody knows? You've not heard of a.out? No? Nobody's heard of a dot out? Well, okay, I guess, I guess we're, we're used to using an, an integrated development environment, I guess, huh? That's what we do in terminal to run something, right? Yeah, in terminal, yeah. When you do C++, you know, when you actually, when you compile it with the GCC mm -hmm. or G++, yeah. then, then after you compile it, how do you run it? You do a dot. Yeah, you type a dot out. Yeah. A dot out is the name of the file that contains the machine language program. That's the default name of the file that contains the machine language program. All right, so that's trying to relate it to something you already know. To do like dash O to rename or something like that? Yeah, and you can do hyphen O, yeah, dash O to rename it. But if you don't do the hyphen O, then the default name is A dot out, yeah. But anyway, so when you, yeah, so, so you, anyway, those are the names of the files. All right, now, what does every program do? Takes processing, I mean, sorry, it takes input. 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 It processes it and it sends it to the output. Now tell me this, what is a compiler? Is it software or hardware? Software. It is software. It is a program. So what does the compiler do? It takes what? The input. Input, processes it and presents it. So what does the compiler take as its input? The code you wrote. Yes. So this is interesting because it is a program that takes another program as input. So it's treating the program, it's treating your source program as if it were? Input. Data. Yeah, as it is input. And so it treats it, yeah, like, like input data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you see what I mean? It's using a program as if it were data. It's an interesting concept, huh? And then, and then it translates it. So here is, um, so then, and everybody's familiar with the fact that if you write a program in C++, you can compile it and run it on a Windows machine or you can compile it and run it on a Mac machine. So how is it that one program can run on two different kinds of machines? Two different 
two different compilers. And so what happens is, in figure 2.3, if you have one C++ source program, you can compile it on brand X computer, and that will produce brand X object program. On the other hand, it's, if you want to, it to run on a different machine, you can take the same program, but it requires a compiler for that other machine. So brand Y C++ compiler will produce brand Y object program. By the way, do you guys know, do you guys know this concept? What happens if you take a C++ source program and you compile it on a, is it possible to compile it on brand X machine but have it run on brand Y machine? Won't it just not be compatible? Well, it's actually possible to do that. Mm -hmm. but, but what happens is, in other words, it's possible to have a compiler on one machine generate object code for a different machine. That's called cross-compiling. Okay. So sometimes, you know, it, it, I mean, it's, 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 pos it's possible to write a computer to generate object code for different kinds of machines, regardless of the machine that it's running on. But it won't work on the machine it's running on. Right. It, what, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. Assuming that the machine code for the two computers are incompatible, it would not, yeah. And so with cross compiler, sometimes you have a switch. You can say, okay, I'll generate the object code for this machine. And then you can run the compiler again and, and have another switch, another dash option, and say, okay, run it for this kind of machine. Or maybe you can have a, an option that says run it for 64 bit, and another option that says run it for 32 bit. Hmm? <laughs> okay. Is everybody good so far? Okay, now here is another one of those uh, slides that you have to memorize. I'm going to ask you this over and over again, okay? <clears throat> this is the C++ memory model. <clears throat> and this is going to be very important whenever we learn about how um, source code gets in C++ gets translated to assembly language. All right? And here are the three parts of the C++ memory model. The first part is global variables are stored in a fixed location in memory. Now, do you guys remember how to tell what kind of a variable is a global variable? Can you identify, well, we're going to do this in a minute. It's we'll not in the function? Yeah, it's not in the main program or not in the function. Yeah, if it's not, that makes it global. Very good. Yeah. That makes it global. On the other hand, local variables, in the yeah, local variables are the ones that are declared inside the function. And where are they stored? Runtime. On the runtime stack. Okay, global variables are not stored on the runtime stack, but local variables are. And the third way to, to use a variable in C++ is a dynamically allocated variable. <clears throat> so these dynamically allocate, allocated variables get allocated with what C++ the heap. Yeah, on the heap, what C++ command uh, operator, the new operator, new. So they knew, and those are allocated on the heap, right? Okay, so just remember that. Okay, now, without looking at your notes, what are the three parts of the memory model? Uh, <laughs> global, global, global Globals where? I can't take them. <laughs> global variable stored where? A fixed, fixed location, locals, locals, locals runtime, runtime stack, stack. Dynamically, allocated. Allocated on the heap. Dynamically. dynamically allocated on the heap. Okay, good. Now, okay, oh geez, there's going to be a lot of memorizing here. The second thing is another one that you have to memorize. Now this is going to be really important. Okay, what happens whenever you call a function in C++? These four things happen. Right? And furthermore, they happen in this order. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the order is important. It's not just, well, one happens one time and might, you know, they, they happen in this order. And we're going to have to know this whenever we translate our programs to assembly language. First of all, what happens is, when you call a function, you push storage for the return value. Now when we say push, 
push is an operation that happens on a what kind stack. of on a stack. So therefore, we're talking about which stack here? The runtime stack. Are you with me? Well, the return value is storage for the return value is allocated on the runtime stack. That's the first thing that happens. The second thing happens is that the, the parameters are pushed onto the runtime stack. Are you with me? Now, do you know the two main ways of calling a parameter? Call by what or call by what? Reference. Ref value. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pass by reference and pass by value. Okay? So either the reference or the value is pushed onto the runtime stack for the parameters. Are you with me? That's the second thing. Mm -hmm. The third thing is the return address. Now, what do we mean by the return address? Why do we have to push the return address onto the runtime stack? So we know where it's it yeah, yeah. So whenever you quit the function and you re return back to the function that called it, that return address is needed so that the computer will know which one to where to go back to because it could be called from several different places, right? Mm -hmm. So it needs, are you, is everybody clear on that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the return address. And the fourth thing is storage for the local variables. Now notice that yeah, it's storage for the local variables. So there's no values there at all. The values, the values are getting pushed with the parameters, but with the local variables, that's just storage for the local variable. You don't know what the values are. Is everybody clear on that? Okay, so memorize that. Now, what happens whenever you return from a function? Obviously. In which order? In the opposite order. So here it was push storage for the return value, push the parameters, push the return address, push storage for the local variables. When you return, you deallocate the locals. Are, are you with me? Then you pop the return address. Yeah? Because, uh, because the stack is what in, what out? First. First. Last in, first out. LIFO. Last in. La last in, first out. Yeah, last in, first out. LIFO. All right. So, so what's on? You are you with me? You you push the stuff onto the stack this way, and then you pop it off this way, right? Because it's LIFO. So you, first you deallocate the local variables, then you pop the return address, then you deallocate the parameters, and then you pop the return value. And that's because it's a stack. All right? Is everybody good? Okay. This one's not as crucial, but anyway. Every C++ variable has three attributes, a name, a type, and a value. Mm -hmm. That's like the first thing you learned. First thing you learned when you started to learn how to program? Oh. Yeah. So like if you say, in, here, if you actually, it's, it's interesting if we do this, if we say in C++, if you say like int i, what is the int? The int is the what? The type. The, type. the i is the name. name. What about the value? It well, yeah, it's it's not on the listing here, because where does the the na the the type and the name appear in the program listing, but the value doesn't occur until what time? Until you initialize it. Yeah, and when when is that? There's actually two crucial times that that are important in programming when you write a program. One is compile time. And the other one is runtime, also called execution time. So you set this up. This is in the listing, right? At compile time, you give this to the you give this listing to the compiler. Mm -hmm. But when does the value come into existence? At runtime. Run that happens at run, the value comes into existence at runtime or at execution time. Are you with me? So there's, uh, name and type are kind of like in one category and values in the other category because that value happens when the program is executing. Are we good? And where can that, where, what are the three possibilities of where that value will reside? It'll either reside in what? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, what's the first one? The, a, fixed a fixed location in memory if it's a global value. Runtime, runtime stack if it's a what? Local, local variable or a... What else did we push onto the runtime stack? Uh, a local variable or a what? A function? No. Parameter. Or a parameter. parameter. Mm -hmm. A local variable or a parameter. Or uh, the other place it could reside is on the what? The 
on the heap if it's a dynamically allocated variable. All right, so here is a nonsense program to illustrate global variables. Oh, too bad the slide gave it away. I was going to ask you, what kind of variable is CH? Character. Yeah, that's its type, but is it local or global or dynamic? Global. It's global, and how do you know it's global? It's not in. It's, yeah, it's outside the main program. Are you with me? So here's what we do. Well, so what does this program do? It, it's, uh, CH is a global variable, int is a global variable, sorry, J is a global variable, CH is a global variable of type care, J is a global variable of type int, this inputs CH and J and does some processing and outputs it, and what does the, um, and so here, Global variables are declared outside of main. Local variables are declared inside main. And so here, figure 2.5 is a picture of how this program, of the, of the memory when the program executes. Now look at this, figure 2.5. Notice that, actually let's go back to the listing. So, so what are the two global variables? CH and J, right? Now, what about main? anything inside main? What is main, by the way? Function. It is a function. So what calls the function? No, no, no. This is the main program. Is it automatically called at runtime? Yeah, but what calls it? The compiler. No, the compiler, tra oh, that was a good try, but, but, beep. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, the compiler doesn't call it. What calls it? Does it just float down from the ether? Da 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 da. This is an innovator. Boom! Now it's executing. What calls the main? If main is a function, what calls? Say it again. Constructor. What? Constructor. No. The processor. No. Oh well, the processor executes it, but what calls it? The bus. <laughs> no, what is the bus? Wires. <laughs> a group of wires. <laughs> no, the group of wires doesn't call it. <laughs> uh, the user. No. Memory. No. Oh, you guys, did you not remember? Look, what was that? What were the levels? What were the levels? Application. Yeah, keep going. High order. High Assembly. Instruction set. Active. Operating system <gasps> level. What? Operating uh, system. What calls the main program? The operating the system. The operating system uh -huh. is in charge of running, of, of executing all the jobs in the system. The operating system calls main. Is everybody clear on that? This is a kind of an important concept. Are, you, are we good? The operating system calls. So main is just a function that the operating system calls. Now what happens whenever you call a function? To, uh, okay, what are the four things? Don't know peaking. What are the four things that happen whenever you call a function? Push and let's see what push, push, push the, the what? Storage for, the value. Value. Storage for the return value. What's the return? What's the type of the return value? Int. Int. So do you see that whenever the the operating system calls, it has to allocate an int? Mm -hmm. And then what's the second thing? Are there any parameters in this one? No. 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 What's the next thing it calls? Space for variable. No. Oh, the return address. Yes, the return address. So now what will the return address be? It will, it will push the return address, yeah? Back to the operating system? Yes, that will be an address back to somewhere in the operating system so that when it goes back to there, the operating system can do its, you know, get the next job in, right? Mm -hmm. do, do the next thing that it wants to do. Are you with me on that? Is everybody clear on that? So how big will the runtime stack be for this? No, not the run, no, the runtime stack will not have four cells in it. How many cells will the runtime stack? One. No. What did we, we just went through, what, we just went through. It doesn't have parameters. Right, no parameters, but so what did we say it would have? The return address. No, the first thing would be what? Storage for the return, storage for the return value, and the second thing would be what? Return address. The return address. It's those two. Now, does everybody see that? Yeah. So, are you with me on this? And then where are those uh, CH and J, uh, CH and J stored? Fixed where? Okay. Fixed, okay, because they are what? Global. Globals. Okay, so now. Now, does everybody understand figure 2.5 now? 
Are you with me on two, figure 2.5? Because the runtime stack, you know, when you call this the runtime stack, storage for the return value, and then the return address. Now, on this return address, what I have in there is like RA0. That just means return address 0, which is some address in the operating system. We don't know, you know, those details. Are you with me? But there is. That's what, it, that's what the stack looks like. Is everybody clear? And then CH, you know, J is, you know, CH is, and J are in a fixed location. Is everybody with me on this? And then these values happen, you know, when this program, as this program executes. So here, you know, you do CN, CH, J. So if somebody inputs, if the input is the letter M and then 419 for the J, and then it does some processing, blah, blah, blah. So right after it does the input, or let me see, has it added 5 to J yet? Yeah, this is after it has added. I think this is right before it's getting ready to return. Right? Is everybody clear? It input the four it input the four hundred and nineteen, it added five to it, it added one to M to make it N. You know, so that made it N. Is everybody clear? Mm -hmm. And then when it quits it goes and pops that stuff back off. Are you with me? All right, here's another one. Now, tell me what the runtime stack's gonna look like. What do we have for, uh, ex we got bonus, exam one, exam two, and score, and int main. So, storage. so, so it's gonna have storage for the return value. Okay, it's first one, storage for the return value. No. Actually, here, let's, let's see if we can predict it. So, so when it calls main, so what, what's it gonna be? So this return value, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we call that ret val. Okay, then what? And then there's no parameters. There's no parameters, okay, so nothing on top of that. And then what? Return wait, 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 return. which order? Return address. return address, okay, so this would be return address. Okay, and this would be something like RA0, right? Storage for local variables. Yes, so now how many local variables? No. Oh, three. three. Constant yes. Constant isn't a oh. variable? Correct. A constant is not a variable. A Are you with me? A constant is not a variable. Are you with me? Is everybody with me? Mm -hmm. Okay, so then it would be three more, right? Like this. And furthermore, look, when you draw these, one of your exercises, or a lot of, several of your exercises are to, to, to draw this, it's in this order. Notice that in the, in the listing, it's first exam one, then exam two, and then score. So it's, but it's going, it's being pushed, right? Mm -hmm. So this one is, so you put exam one here, exam two here, and then score here. Are you with me? Would, I have a question, would the constant be stored in a fixed location or? No, a, uh, no, a fixed, need, none, nothing, need, none of those three. And how does it? How does it access the bonus loop? Uh, you will see. It's a mystery, and we will have to see how that works. But the point now is that it's not a variable, and right. so therefore it's not one. See how it's not, in it's not stored in any of those locations, right? Are you with me? No. Mm -hmm. Nah. Nah. The plot thickens. <laughs> how is it going to do that? <laughs> see, we will open up the hood and peer into the mystery. <laughs> Are we, is everybody good? Now let's see how pretty, oh well, you know, me, uh, integer division in mod. Okay, and now, so did we do it right? Here's our picture, figure 2.8. Did we do it right? Ret val, what does it say? Ret val, then the return address, and then what? Exam one, exam two, score. Is everybody clear? So you can do this, yeah? You can draw the and then, so on the left, it's before any input statements. On the right, it's after the input statements. Yeah? Are we good? Okay, you know operators less than, greater than. This is a review for people who don't know C++, you know, so we can go kind of quickly over this. Um, now, what is this? Another int main const int num. Oh, here's an if statement. So, we know if statements. Uh, we can. What's this one? A switch statement. You know switch statements. Yeah, okay. What's this one? While loop, you know, what does this do? 
happy star. And so this loops through one character at a time. Until you get to Until you get your hamburger or the happy star. Until you get your hamburger. You, got, got, you don't know the happy star? No. Hamburger? Carl's oh. Jr. Hmm? Yeah, isn't that Carl's Jr.? Yeah. Yeah. I've never had Carl's Jr. You never had Carl's Jr.? Oh, come on. It's not a, a little product placement in the lecture here. <laughs> I'm going to go collect my advertising fee. <laughs> Did you guys see uh, the Joneses? That was good about the... Well, never mind. It sounds like nobody saw it. All right, so, okay, so there's that one. What's this next one? Oh, this is do while. So what's the difference between... Why, yeah. Uh, do... What was the, the previous one was while, we did that in but this one is do. So what's the difference between do and while? You do that while cop is less than driver, and then as soon as... What's the difference between... The check is after oh. instead of Yeah, the check is after instead of before. What? You never used the do loop before? You never heard the do loop we before? Do we loop in UML. used it in UML. We never used it in coding. Except well. We did, like wrote it. Well, here it is. You can do it in C++. But what are you, what are you testing? Well, look how it works. Well, cop that? gets zero. Look, cop gets zero. Driver gets 40. Mm -hmm. Are you with me? Then it just says do. Mm -hmm. And so regardless of what the value of cop or driver is, you always do the, the body of the loop one time. It's guaranteed to execute one time. And so what happens is cop plus gets 25, driver plus gets 20, and then it says while cop is less than driver. So there's the test for the loop is at the bottom instead of at the top. So if it's true, it goes back and does the do again? Yes. And if it fails, that's the only time it will exit? Yes. But the difference is, is that the loop, the test for the loop is at the bottom instead of being at the top. Okay. It's not as common, but sometimes it's important. I mean, it's sometimes it's really handy to have the... And when would you want to use a do loop instead of a while loop? When you want to guarantee what? That it executes that the ex Yes, that the body executes always at least one time. It actually comes in quite handy. <clears throat> and where would, where would cop and driver be stored in this program? Global. So they're in a fixed location. In a fixed location, yes. All right, next one is, what's the next one? Oh, the next one is a for loop. You guys know for loops, right? Mm -hmm. And he, he, what is this, int vector four? Um, it's an array. That is an array. With four spots. With four spots in it, four cells in it. And where are those four cells? Zero, one, two, three. Yeah, there is a, you're right, there is a vector sub zero, a vector sub one, a vector sub two, and a vector sub three. But my question is, where are those variables stored? Oh, yeah. in this runtime stack. On the runtime stack. Why? Because this vector is a what? Local. Is a local variable. Is everybody clear on that? Okay. So, um, so do I have to draw that, a picture of that? I think so you is can. each slot its own? Yeah, maybe we should sketch that. I, I see I might not have a pic picture of that. Um, so, okay, so let's do, so the, the uh, operating system calls the function, right? And so this is the ret val. Are you with me? This is the ret val for the main. Is everybody clear? Mm -hmm. Which is an int. And then what? No parameters. No parameters, then what? Return address. Return address. Okay, and now what? J. No. No. Ve vector. Oh, sorry. No. Because that's. <laughs> okay. So so, ve but now vector. But now, how many cells for vector? Five. Four. 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 So now, so vector looks like this. So this is vector. Sub zero. This is vector sub one. Vector sub two, vector sub three. Is everybody? Three first? No, it's like this. The whole vector gets pushed on. Oh, okay. Are you with me? And the numbering is zero, one, two, three. That's going to be important actually later on. Is everybody clear on this? And then what's the next one? Int j. J, int j. So there's j. So that's, this is how many cells are. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven cells on the runtime stack after you call, after the, 
operating system calls main. Is everybody good? Okay. Now, what if the function is void? What if it's a void function? Can you skip Doesn't. the return? Yeah, it's the same as before, only there's just no retval, right? So deallocation is the opposite, okay? And so now what happens, is, so now here's uh, figure 2.16. Here's the main program. So we have int main, cn num points. What do, num, what do you suppose that stands for? The number of number points. points, okay? And then you do 4j gets 1, j less than or equal to num points, j plus plus. So what does that do? It'll have j go up to the number of points. points. Yeah, and each time you go through the loop, we do what? We input a value, mm -hmm. right? And then we, we call what? Print bar. print bar. So then print, now, now what does print bar do? So we give that number to the print bar, right? Mm -hmm. Now what does print bar do? Star. Int n, int k, or sorry, uh, int n is the parameter, right? So value corresponds to n. It outputs a number of stars. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. A star for every point, and then it goes to the next line, right? Mm -hmm. So here, if the input is 12, and then the numbers are 3, 13, 17, 34, 27, 23, and nah, nah, the output looks like this, right? So it's like a little histogram, yeah? The first row has three stars, the second row has 13 stars. And what happens if, the, if it's zero? It's zero stars, and then two, there's two stars at the bottom. Yep. All right, does everybody? It will only, it will only go up to 12 digits. Like hmm? You can't have more 12 options. Well, no, 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 that's because the 12 is the count. Just the initial input, right? The tw yes, that 12, notice that the first row doesn't have 12 stars. Right. The first number is, this so is called, this the, called the count technique. The loop terminates after 12. Yes. Yeah, it uses right. the first number in the data stream as the count of how many to follow. It's a count technique. Yeah, are we good? Okay. But now the question is, um, how does, now the main program, sorry, the operating system calls main, right? So then what does the runtime stack for main look like? Does it have print bars in it? No, just main. When it calls main, what does the runtime stack look like? Return value. Return value, return address. Is that it? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the rest is all global. Yeah. Global? Well, num points, value. Oh, value. you're right. It is global. The rest is global. That val. Is the function print bar? That's not considered. That'll be on the runtime, right? No, that's not a very a function is not a variable. Okay, so this is ret val ret address. Okay, but now, but then what happens? Call print bar. It calls print bar. So, so this part right here, this is for the main program, right? Mm -hmm. Then it calls print. Now, what happens when we call print bar? So we go on what what goes on? What is there a ret val? No, so just is it void? Address. Void. So there's no ret val. So then what? The parameter, so what's the parameter? N. So we put N here. Is everybody clear on that? Then what? Return address. Return address. Now what's our return address? Main program. Yeah, now you see, um, do you see on the main program where I have a little comment slash slash RA1? Okay. That's a little comment that we'll use and th so this means we'll go back to return RA1. So is the other one RA0? Oh yeah, it's RA0, somewhere in the operating system. Okay. And then what else? Is there anything else? Is there, are there any local variables? K. 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 So K. So this whole thing, by the way, um, have we, s we haven't mentioned this yet. This whole thing outlined in green this is called, it has two, two names. One of these is called an activation record. The whole box? Is the the, uh, each, each call, the, all the ones for one call. It's called an activation record. But it's also called uh, a, um, oh, 
why is my memory failing me here? It's activation record. I don't use activation record. I use the other one all over. Stack frame. Okay, it's either called an activation record or a stack frame. It's all the cells for one call. Is everybody clear? So here's, oh, oh, and then I forgot to put, well, wait. So here we begin. Here we input the num points. Oh, and notice that num points value and j are global. Are you with me? And then four, blah, 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 and then we see in the value. Now watch what happens. We push the formal parameter. In part F, we push the return address. In part G, we push the storage for the local variable. So there it is. Is everybody clear how that works? So in your exercises, you have to draw stack frames. So it's important to be able to get them in the right order. Yeah? Using that. Do you put the global ones on the side like that? Yeah, and put the global ones on the side. They are not on the stack. Right. Those, that's in a fixed location in memory because okay. they are global. But we need to put those on there. Absolutely. So here are two of the three. This program illustrates two of the three parts of the C++ memory model. Are we good? Yeah. Now here's what's going to happen, you guys. Every, after a while, we're just going to dispense with these two, right? I mean, the operating system is always going to call main, and main's always going to have an int, so it's never going to have a parameter. We're never going to use parameters. Are you with me? So I, I don't remember if it's the next one or the next one after that. We're going to start just showing, just omitting this. Are you with me? But it really, that's really the way it, it is. Is everybody clear? Just because I don't want to have to write the same thing over and over again. Is everybody good on that convention? All right. Now, what do we have, sports fans? What kind of a program in figure 2.18? A, oh shoot, never mind. I was getting all excited. I thought this was going to be, this is just another program with a loop, isn't it? Yeah, this is factorial with a loop. Okay, well, there's... What's star get? Hmm? Star, star gets? Times, times gets. If, pl if plus gets, what would plus gets be? You just, you add it on to the F. It's yeah, like F but yeah, but, not, but now it's times gets. So, so it's so F times J. Yes. Okay. So that's F, F gets F times, times J. J. Yeah. And you can do it with slash gets. You can do it with... Yeah. Mod gets. Mod gets. Yeah. Are we good? Can you do like with booleans? Can you do like or get? I don't know if you can do. I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised, but you know, not a hundred percent sure. So here, I'll let you guys. Oh, by the way, is this the first time we've done a retval? Yeah. Well, this is the first time we've done a retval with fact. Uh, okay. So look, let's think about what happens when we call fact. Its factorial is now here. Oh, notice that here in the main program we says its factorial is, and now where's my RA1? It, it's on the same line as the function call, right? So is everybody clear on that? So what it's going to do is it's going to call, when it calls fact num, then it goes up in fact and it, we have a parameter int n, right? But now when we call fact, how many cells will be on that stack frame? How many cells will be on the stack frame for? Total? Total, yeah, yeah let's count them. What would the first one be? Return value. Ret val. Address. Address. And then you're going to have... Wait, the parameters? They don't have oh, wait, wait, sorry. Do the parameters come before the red address? So you don't have parameters. Yeah, we do. No. But not for the main. N. I'm talking about the stack frame for when we call the stack frame for when we call fact. Okay, so retval, what's the next one? One for parameter. One for the parameter, that's two. One for return address, that's three. And then two local variables. And then two local variables, F and J. Is everybody good? Okay, so does everybody, let's see if that corresponds. So let's take a look here, it's figure 2.19. Part H, does everybody see? Ret, ret val N, ret address F and J. Is everybody clear mm -hmm. how that worked? Okay. Are we good? 
So if main had a local variable, would that come at the top or would that come right after return address? If main had a local variable, it would be on the runtime stack and it would be above the ret address. What if it's called after? Yeah, what, what if it was called after the function? What do you mean? Called after the function. Called what do you mean? Call. Call. So after you, what do you, mean you call this function and that gets pushed onto the stack. And then you define a local Another variable. Oh, it would still be no, no, you can't. How can you define? I don't understand. What, in in the coding here, what were you ask, so asking after, me where? After see out its factorial is below that line, if you had a new variable there. Oh, yes. We will. Uh, yeah, that's a very good question, actually. We will never. Okay, okay. It, in C, in C, it is possible to declare a variable not at the beginning, but later on in the code. Wherever you declare it, when it gets to that the first time, that's when it go, that's when it's allocated. Oh wait, is that true? So would it go on top of all? Wait, wait, I take that back. No, no, hold on, hold on. I think. Oh boy, this is a good question that I don't know the answer to right off the bat. I think in order to allocate a new a variable in a function in the middle of a function, does it have to be in the beginning of a block? I think it should be. No, no, no. Actually, I think you're right. I don't think it does. Ooh, that's a good question. Does it actually allocate it then? You know, as it's going down, as it goes, as it goes down, does it actually allocate it, boom, then? Or does it collect them all and allocate them once at the beginning of the function? I don't know the answer to that question. I'll have to it research that. Style, though, to well, the you know, a lot of times, not not necessarily, because do don't you know how a lot of times we do for int i gets? Mm -hmm. That's, That's int i is declaring the int i, and in that case, I know that the int i, the i only exists in the for loop. You cannot access it outside the the for loop. Mm -hmm. So it actually gets deallocated after the for loop. But then. And my question, the question that I'm asking myself here, that I'm sorry I don't have the answer to, Wait, is... Do you need another local variable for fact, for j? Oh, we already declared it. We already declared it up at the so beginning. So if it weren't declared, though? That's what I'm asking. That's what I'm mulling over. Then we'd have to declare it? Hmm? I mean, if the j wasn't declared there, then we'd have to make a slot for it on the stack still? Do you treat 4 like a function, maybe? 4 is not a function. No, it is not a function. And I know in all the examples in this book, I don't ever declare, all local variables are declared at the beginning of the function. I like that. It yeah, it makes it easy to locate, yeah. Then it's, we don't have questions about But if you have this little local variable, int for int i gets, I right. think that's fine. But you, would you have to make a spot for it? No, I'm saying, no. I'm saying that's, but yeah, now, see, because I, I know that you, in C++, there is the concept of a block. And the block is, you know, like an open brace. So I'm not sure if it has to be at the front, at the beginning of an open... No, it doesn't have to be at the beginning of an open brace. But in the for loop, you couldn't use it outside of it, right? Correct. I, knew, I do know that. So then but see, my, que my question is, yeah, but the, your, your question is whether, the, whether a variable so declared in the middle of a function is allocated on the runtime stack at that point. Well, yeah. wouldn't it have to be? If you can't access the for loop variable afterwards. Yeah, and if you can't access you this can't variable loop, to... It would push the i. Yeah. When you're out of the for loop, it would pop it off. Yes. Well, what I'm thinking of is if it's in the middle of a block, and then and you come here, and then it allocates it, then does that mean at the end of the block, it gets deallocated? Oh, because you can't access it outside. Actually, I've had this happen before in a... By making... Yeah, you have to make a block in, the, in, the, in a switch. Well, is it a in a case of a switch statement... I've, ha I've run across this problem before, but now I kind of don't remember the issue. Mm. I looked into this at one point in time, but I've forgotten. Well, we'll have to, yeah, I'll have to explore. explore. Okay, so anyway, that's that. Now, in call by reference, do you remember this? Mm -hmm. In call by value, the what gets the what of the what? <laughs> gets the value of the actual parameter. Are you with me? Is this review, I hope? If the formal parameter changes, the actual parameter does not change in call by value. Are you with me, sports fans? Yeah. 
okay? On the other hand, in call by reference, the formal parameter gets a what? Reference. A reference to the actual parameter. I should have been quizzing you on which one is the actual parameter and which one is the formal parameter in all of these examples, huh? Mm -hmm. And in call by reference, if the formal parameter changes, the actual parameter does change because it really refers to the actual parameter. Are you with me? Now how do we indicate this call by reference on when we draw these runtime stacks? Do you remember how we, do you know how we? Do we put the input the ampersand? Well, in the code, code, in the code, that's how you know it's called by reference, by with the ampersand. But what I'm saying is when you draw the runtime stack. Do you put stars? No, you put a little, what you do is this. If this is called by reference, it refers to, here, it refers to something else. Just like a, what does this look like? Like a pointer. Are we good? So here's a little program. Void swap, void order, int main. Int a, b, what are a and b? What kind of variables? Globals. Okay, so we input a fixed location, right? But then main is going to call what? What does main call? Uh, order. order. And then order says, and then what does a, wh okay, now which, what's a actual. in order? Is actual or formal? Actual. It's actual. And x is the what? Formal. formal. So now what is that int ampersand x? That means x does what? Call by reference. Call by reference, so x refers to a. Mm -hmm. So now, so what would the stack frame look like for order? It would have... Okay, void, so no retval. And then it would have an x, which would point to the a. Which is in... But it's a global. Fixed, it, global variable, so, the fixed, so it would the just point location. over to the left? Would it point to the fixed location? Yes, it would. Yes, it would. So everybody, sounds like you got it, right? Mm -hmm. So, and then, so here, enter an integer 6 enter an integer 2, ordered they are 2, 6. So here it is. And when we begin, A and B are at a fixed location in memory. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Is everybody good? A and B, fixed location in memory. We input A, B, so that inputs the 6 and the 2. And then, when we call order A, B, X refers to A and Y refers to B. Are we good? And then order calls what? Swap. swap. And now in swap, did you notice in the code that you were called by reference. it was called by reference again? So what happened was S referred to Y, but Y does what? Refers to, refers to B. So therefore, S refers to B. You see how they kind of merge there? Mm -hmm. Is everybody good on this? And you can count exactly how many cells on each stack frame. Can't you? Mm -hmm. All right. And then it comes back. And then when we return, those things have been swapped. Because those, it was actually changing the values in there. Okay, so that's our review. And now comes what? Recursive. Now comes a recursive version of factorial. Are you with me? And what kind of, okay, so it's, it's the same kind of um, thing. Now what do, but now what does fact call? It says else return n times what? Fact. Fact of n minus, n minus 1. So does everybody see then, here is the first call to fact 4. Are you with me? In fact 4 calls what? Fact 3. Fact 3. Fact three calls fact and then fact 3 calls fact 2, and then fact 2 calls fact 1. Mm -hmm. And every single one of them has a ret val. They have the same return address? Well, except for ret the, the one from the main program has RA1. Mm -hmm. The other ones have RA2. Mm -hmm. Are you with me on that? See? Here, notice that the RA1 is the return address from the main program. RA2 is the return address of the inside the function, the recursive function. Are we good? Mm -hmm. Okay, so it goes all the way up to the top, and then it uses the retval, you know, it uses retval to return the value. So, 
we compute you know it computes the ret val and then it returns and then that it takes the one and it multi on in part g of the figure it takes the one from the ret val it multiplies it times the n which is two root. and gives you the ret val of two in part h does everybody see how that unwinds mm -hmm. boom 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 and here is the call tree fact four fact three fact two fact one and then fact one returns one, fact two returns two, fact three returns six, and fact four returns 24. Is everybody good? This is our review. And now do you remember, oh, well, here's another, well, it's time for us to quit. But um, I think what you have to do for um, Thursday is, uh, here's one with, a, um, with a, uh, an array. You can read through that. And here, do you remember this, figure 227? Who's, whose triangle is this? Pascal. It's Pascal's triangle. Remember Pascal's triangle? Mm -hmm. So these are the binomial coefficients. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then here is a recursive version of the binomial coefficient. And here is the, here's the runtime stack. And uh, yeah. And so your exercise for Thursday I think you can do this. You've seen this before and we've reviewed how the stacks work, right? Mm -hmm. So your exercise for Thursday is to draw a snapshot of the runtime stack at a, with a certain call at a certain time. Okay. All right? Mm -hmm. But you use these rules, this C++ memory model rules. For what? To construct, this, and the stack it should look something like this. Is it going to be for the binomial coefficient or something? It will be for the binomial coefficient, yeah. So you'll have to, but it'll be a different example from this, different values from this one. We can use question marks? Yeah. Well, the question marks are the ones that haven't been assigned yet. Right. Oh, okay. So I, I, you know, I think in the, I think in the book, I, I, now, I, now I think in the book I leave them blank. I think in an earlier edition I used to put question marks. Can we leave them blank? You can leave them blank. Yeah. It just means it hasn't been assigned right. yet. Yeah. That's all that okay. means. Yeah? Are we good? Yeah. Okay. See you next time.